Thank you to all of you for joining us today. Thank you to American University Center for Environmental Filmmaking for creating the amazing film we just watched. And a special thanks to our panel of incredible speakers that we are about to hear from. Again, my name is Diana Van Vliet and I am the Director of Outreach and Engagement for the American Lung Association's Healthy Air Campaign and your moderator for today's event. Before we, we begin our panel discussion, I would like to point out a few things in the chat box. You can find the closed captioning link in the chat in addition to information on how to ask questions. Feel free to submit questions at any time through the Q&A feature on Zoom. We will also share the official social media handles for today's panelists in the chat box, including some corrected social media information. Today's panel will focus on the connections between air pollution, climate change, and inequity, and the critical work being done to advance solutions that address all three interconnected issues. The American Lung Association has long championed clean air for everyone and advocates, for, and advocates for policies that reduce air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions, which drive climate change. Climate change, climate change is harming health in a number of ways, including by making air quality worse. From more frequent and intense wildfires, increasing the amount of particle pollution in the air, to increased, increasing temperatures leading to the formation of more ground level ozone pollution, also known as smog. Through our new Stand Up for Clean Air initiative, the American Lung Association is asking everyone to pledge to take collective action on climate change and healthy air, and is elevating and amplifying conversations around climate change and air pollution as health issues. It's important to have conversations like the one we're having today. And if you want to host your own virtual screening of Unbreathable or other short films on healthy air, climate change, and environmental justice, the Lung Association is actually launching a Healthy Air Activist Toolkit tomorrow which includes film and film screening guides, among other free resources. You can learn more at lung.org slash air. With that, I will now introduce today's amazing speakers. Shoshanda Campbell is a community leader and activist for environmental justice. As a student at Ben Franklin High School in South Baltimore, Shoshanda co-founded Free Your Voice, a student-led group that worked for five years to shut down the largest incinerator proposal in US history set to be built less than a mile away from their school. Shoshanda has since helped develop the South Baltimore Community Land Trust to create community-led development without displacement, permanently affordable housing, and zero waste infrastructure. A lifelong Baltimore resident, Shoshanda is committed to the implementation of Baltimore's Fair Development Plan for Zero Waste to help lead her city through a just transition that respects our lives and our planet. Ruhan Nagra is a community advocate and human rights lawyer at the University Network for Human Rights. She has worked on a range of human rights issues in the United States, India, and the occupied Palestinian territory. For the past three years, Ruhan has partnered closely with the Concerned Citizens of St. John Parish, a community group fighting toxic emissions from a neoprene facility in Louisiana's Cancer Alley. As part of her work with the Concerned Citizens, Ruhan led the design and implementation of an unprecedented health study of the area near the neoprene plant and has engaged in environmental justice advocacy locally, nationally, and internationally. Ruhan holds a JD from Stanford Law School and a BA from Brown University. Lana Weidgenint is a climate justice activist and advocate for shifting to plant-rich food systems as a climate solution. She currently works at the as the Deputy Partnerships Director for Zero Hour, a youth-led movement creating entry points, training, and resources for new young activists and organizers and adults who support this vision, wanting to take concrete action around climate change. She is a Brazilian immigrant to the United States who moved from her Florida home to Washington, D.C., the Washington, D.C. area, to attend college full-time at John Hopkins University. Welcome, panelists. To start us off, um, we'll, we'll do a lightning round. Um, and I wanted to ask this question of each of you. What initially, initially prompted each of you to get into activism and advocacy efforts? Was there a personal connection or moment when you realized you wanted to work as an activist? I think that the way I got involved, as you saw in the video, was through Free Your Voice, um, a student-led group out of Benjamin Franklin. Um, that took on the challenge of this proposal of an incinerator being less than a mile away from our school. This is going to be 
the nation's largest incinerator um, that was going to be pulling waste from all over. And so it was basically making us a dumping ground um, at a bigger level than the city level, which our community already is at the city level, the dumping ground that has all these infrastructures. Um, and so going against that billion dollar um, company, um, it was really a big win that we did come out on top after all the people came back and spoke against this infrastructure um, infrastructure in our community um, that was gonna essentially kill us. And so it was a lot of organizing and doing outreach to let people know what was happening um, and then fighting back. And that's what, and it was that, that moment when we did win and when we did come together and do these marches um, against this um, company that had a lot of money that we didn't have um, and they had a lot of subsidies that was coming from the government that was allowing the um, to be there and come and hurt us. Um, and so seeing people come together and build that power, it made me want to be an activist. It made me want to keep doing this work because people do care. Um, and people, um, there should be no system that determines who gets to live and who gets who doesn't. It just shouldn't be a system made that way. And so that is why we always put equity at the forefront of the system we're trying to create now. Um, that's to be just. Thank you so much, Shashanda. I can't imagine anything more more personal or, or important than that. Um, Ruhan, what about you? Yeah, um, so my, my point of entry into activism and advocacy for, for social justice was actually the Palestine Solidarity Movement. Um, in late 2008, early 2009, I was a junior in college. Um, Israel had just launched a massive military assault on the Gaza Strip. Um, that lasted over three weeks and killed about 1,400 Palestinians. Um, it was a massacre, and I remember feeling at the time that you know something was very, very wrong in terms of the discourse around Israeli occupation and Palestinian human rights um, on my college campus, but also you know in the U.S. more broadly. So I became very active um, on campus as a Palestine solidarity activist, and after college, ended up living in Palestine for two years. Um, and seeing firsthand, um, you know, the, the daily life under occupation for Palestinians. And of course, you know, there are the elements that are relatively well known, military checkpoints and settlements and settler only roads, mass incarceration and night raids and arrests. But um, what I learned is that Palestinians uh, have also struggled against environmental injustice for decades. Um, there's systematic th uh, Israeli theft of Palestinian natural resources, most notably water resources. Um, but I also learned that, you know, several polluting factories are, have been relocated from Israel to uh, the occupied Palestinian territory since the 1980s. Um, and, you know, essentially once it was discovered that the, the factories were, were causing adverse health impacts, Israel just relocated them uh, to Palestine. Um, and now Palestinians who live near those factories are, are suffering from cancer and respiratory disease, as well as the, you know, very important but often overlooked psychosocial uh, effects of, of living with environmental injustice. So I did some ethnographic work in the area near the most prominent of those Israeli factories in Palestine. Um, and then when I returned to the US after a couple of years of living there, um, I went to law school and I've worked on human rights issues, including environmental justice issues ever since, uh, both in the US and abroad. And I've seen over and over again, something that I think this panel really speaks to, which is that environmental justice is interconnected with racial justice, with struggles against imperialism and militarism and with economic justice. And I think like, just to piggyback off what you just said, um, that in our community, we have an open air coal pile, we have the landfill, we have an already a medical waste incinerator and the fresco incinerator. Um, and we had this proposal for another incinerator. Um, and this community is made up of people of color and low income. And so to speak to exactly what you just said, it is happening all around the world on this bigger level um, that people just have to connect and share these experiences and fight back against this system um, that is racist and inequitable. Um, just to piggyback off of what you said. Thank you both. Um, Lana, what about you? What was your entry point? Well, I was involved in advocacy organizations before uh, getting involved in the international youth climate movement, but I definitely had a moment where I really jumped into the youth climate movement. And even though I had seen the impact of climate change happening in my communities where I'm from, I had um, in Brazil and where my family immigrated to in Florida and I had pretty much grown up with the climate crisis as much of my generation has. 
I still didn't become part of the movement until I felt like it needed someone to step up. And I felt like that someone could be me. And I definitely don't recommend that. I think that everyone who is even slightly concerned about climate change should get involved in whatever capacity they can, who's concerned about environmental justice or clean air. But for me, I still didn't feel like I was the right person to lead in that effort. Um, after I don't have a climate science degree and I'm still in school. And it wasn't until I saw an article in, I remember February 2019, that youth in Europe had been school striking to demand action on climate change, that I was really launched into the youth climate movement and took it upon myself to bring the climate strikes to the United States and to have the youth of the US also demand urgent action from our leaders, right? We know why this is very important. The US is the largest historical emitter of greenhouse gases. We were pulling out of the Paris Agreement, all of these different reasons why in the US we also need to put pressure on our leaders. And I completely agree with what has been said in terms of the experiences of Shoshanda and her community. I think that's definitely the case around the world where we see that communities that are contributing the least to the climate crisis are being the most impacted first and worst by environmental injustice and also by climate change, which is coming rapidly. So I think that's not a really important issue um, in the international movement as well. Thank you all so much. Um, it's really helpful to hear those personal stories. And um, I think, you know, making it personal and realizing that this, these broad issues are in connected, interconnected um, and affect everyone. It's so important to, to communicate that um, as well. So I really appreciate you sharing your perspectives and your entry points. Um, we'll start off with Shoshanda. Um, so the movement to successfully shut down the plans to build a trash incinerator in your community, as we saw in the film, uh, was so impressive. Can you talk a little bit about the biggest obstacle, obstacles you and for your voice faced to stop this incinerator from being built? Um, yes, I think like one of the ones that we were, that I was speaking to earlier is that um, this community has been burdened with this pollution for so long that even with talking with residents, it sunk in that like, this is not going to change. This is going to be this way, even with all the health packs, impacts that we were seeing in the community. Um, a lot of, lot of asthma. Um, you go into the schools and you say, who have asthma here? And 90% of the hands go up. Um, we couldn't have a, the school couldn't have a basketball team because they couldn't run for long because they had asthma. Um, and so it was just seeing these things that just wasn't normal, but has been internalized as if it was okay. Um, and then going back against this company that had a lot of money that had backing from the city, uh, we needed the city to, to get off of that side and instantly commit to like residents and commit to better solutions and alternatives to burning and burying. Um, and so with that win and going against that company, um, it changed the conversation in the city. It changed the conversation from we, we don't want to be a dumping ground. We don't want that. And like, we never wanted that. You guys just created this system. Um, and the part that we were interacting with was always the end of the, sh the short stick, which was that we were going to get those industries in our community um, that was going to hurt us. And it was just paying, playing jeopardy with people's lives. And that wasn't okay. Um, so standing up against that, it gave people a voice. It gave a, a hint that free your voice, uh, which was our name, because it gave people that voice that was taken from them. This incinerator has been here for over 30 years. So that voices have been gone for over 30 years. So this trust in the system and the trust and anything they had to say was completely gone. Um, so we knew it had to come from the community. We knew it had to be us um, to step up and say no more. Um, and we are still doing that actively. We are fighting back against these systems and also at the same time in parallel um, paths, creating a system that we want to see. Uh, we want to see zero waste infrastructure here in Baltimore City um, that is respectful to human life. Um, and stop with the single use plastics. We don't need those um, in our communities. Um, and they, that is taking over. Um, and so it's really just people coming together, people talking and strategizing around what we want to see in our communities and then creating that. The biggest challenge was again, like going against this company and going against these systems that were already in place that are broken, um, they are injustice um, and trying to recreate them. And again, being youth at the time um, and talking to people and them being like, oh, you're, you're, you know, the mentality that you're a kid sometimes. And it's like, yeah, we are kids, but we're willing to step up and fight back against these systems that have been harming you guys. And that is now harming us. Um, and harming our brothers and sisters. Um, many youth and for your voice had personal relations to it, um, including myself around seeing our family 
um, hurt for so long and have these health damages that wasn't anywhere else. So like, before I end, um, Roland Park is a community here in Baltimore City that's about 30 minutes away from um, South Baltimore. And they, we have 15 years shaved off our lives because of the pollution in our communities in relation to them. And that is a wealthy white community. And so it was seeing these dynamics play and knowing that that's what we had to face. That's the challenges that we had to rise to and say, we deserve better, we deserve more. Um, and this system is not it for us. Thank you so much. Um, and I know you, you definitely touched on this just now, but um, how did Free Your Voice engage with local and regional officials and other stakeholders like the school board um, in, in this fight against the landfill? Um, and the incinerator that was proposed less than a mile away from our school, um, it had buy-in from the public school system. Um, and that was a, you know, it was very disappointing to be students that was interacting with this public school system. Um, and they were going to buy into this innovator that was going to hurt us. And so it was going down, to, it was organizing and going to the school board and talking to them and saying like, you have, you have to protect us. Your job is literally to protect us and do what's best for us. Um, and this is not what's best for us. Um, we are hurting. Like we are, there's people in our community that are dying. There's people that's here that didn't have cancer or asthma that now has it for living in this community. Where we live should not be um, whether we live or die. With zip code you were born in should not determine your life expectancy. Um, and that's what we said. We went down there. We told them, like, this, the, uh, you know, this incinerator is not what we want in our community. We have enough polluting. The incinerator that is built here costs $55 million a year in health damages. And that was put out by um, the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, uh, which is experts that were studying this and see what these particles, how they're interacting with our bodies. And that just wasn't right. You know, it was using those numbers. It was telling people, it was giving them what they needed to see that this system that's put in place is harming us and we have to fight back against it or we are going to create generational of death. And we didn't want to see that in our community. Um, so going against the school board and they did back out of that contract. And then it was following suit with whoever else was in that contract and talking with them to say, you have to back out or you will be liable for the deaths that's gonna come from that incinerator um, in our communities. Thank you. Um, so on that note, what advice do you have for other activists who would like to help create change in their community? The advice that I have for other activists is, first of all, know that you're on the right side. Know that right now, it seems like odds are against you, but you can do it, that you can, you have your experiences, you have your stories, you know what's happening in your community, you know how this pollution in these industries are affecting you, and that's what you have power over, you have power over your stories, and tell them to whoever will listen, um, and connect with each other, like break that silence, talk about the elephant in the room in your communities, um, and, and, and talk about it. Just really bring it to the table. It's no more hiding behind closed doors. It is 2020, and there are so many um, injustices that are being brought to life. So jump on that movement. Be a part of that. Whether you are a youth, whether you're an old person, whoever you are, do what you know you need to see in your community. Be that person. No longer wait for that person um, to appear because they are not appearing because it's you. Be that person. Thank you. Um, Ruhan, so uh, going, going off of that uh, inspiring message, um, as we saw in the film, the residents of Reserve, Louisiana uh, are facing an onslaught of health issues due to poor air quality from the Danka plant. You've seen this firsthand as you have provided support for that reserve, the community in reserve, um, in their fight for healthy air. How can lawyers and other outside advocates work effectively with communities impacted by environmental injustice? Yeah, I think that's, th this is a great question because it really speaks to one's theory of how social change happens. And I think Shashanda spoke to this too. And by the way, uh, I'm in total awe of Shashanda and just the incredible work and leadership that, uh, that she's shown in her community. I mean, it's really, um, it's, it is really, really inspiring for, for all of us, I think. Um, 
And and so and Shoshanda spoke to this where you know she said we it was it was us like it, we knew it had this had to come from the community this had to come from those people that are directly affected and I think that's that's exactly right um, I you know personally I've always believed that change happens through broad based social movements led by directly impacted people um, you know movements that are that are led by the most marginalized and vulnerable among us um, transformative change definitely doesn't happen through the law. Um, and in fact, the, the law is often a barrier to change. And so the role of lawyers to me is necessarily a supporting one. Um, I see it as my role to, to take my lead from the directly affected communities that I work with and support their fights however I can. And oftentimes that means drawing on a variety of disciplines and approaches and not just relying on legal tools. So our work with the residents of Reserve Louisiana is a great example. When we first met the Reserve community, we had intensive brainstorming sessions with community members to understand what their goals and priorities are and how our organization could best advance those goals. Um, a year earlier, a year before we first met them, the community had learned from the EPA that they face, as you saw in the video, the highest cancer risk from air pollution in the country due to chloroprene emissions from the Denka facility. Um, now, now that news didn't come as a surprise at all to the community. Folks had felt for decades that there was an abnormal amount of cancer and, and other illness in the community. Um, the, the, um, the clip of, of Mary Hampton driving through and pointing out all the, the, the folks in the neighborhood with cancer, um, I can't tell you the number of times that community members told us, you know, when you walk down the blocks closest to the Denka plant, Someone, someone has cancer, someone has died of cancer in nearly every house. So as we, as we strategized with the community about how we could best support them, community members said, you know, we need a health survey. We want you to go door to door in our neighborhoods and quantify the amount of cancer and other illnesses and symptoms so that we have numbers that we can use to, to back up what we already know to be true. Um, so we partnered with epidemiologists and statisticians and designed a survey-based household health study. Um, 14 of our students underwent intensive training and survey implementation and over the course of nine days surveyed over 500 households in the area around the Denka facility. Um, last year, we released the results of our study, which found that levels of cancer and other illnesses associated with chloroprene exposure are unusually high in the area of the Denka plant when compared with national actuarial tables. And we also found that levels of illness are correlated with proximity to the plant. So there were, there were higher levels of illness closer to the plant than further away. Our, the, the study essentially confirmed um, what community members had been saying for years and years and, and already knew to be true. Um, but here was one more piece of evidence that they could now use and, and have been using in their own advocacy. So even though I'm a lawyer by training, in order to be responsive to the community's needs and priorities and support them in the most effective way possible, um, I had to bring in folks with other expertise and work collaboratively to design and implement a health study. That, that's an example of, I think, of the flexibility that's needed for lawyers and other outside advocates to work effectively with directly impacted communities and really follow the community's lead, lead rather than bringing tools to the table, whether legal or otherwise, that aren't necessarily compatible with the community's priorities. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's a really interesting perspective to um, what, you know, outside allies can do to be effective and um, just everything you were describing. It really, um, a woman from Reserve in the film, um, you know, just mentioning, use the word devastating. And that's truly what I think of when I hear the health impacts you're talking about. It's just unimaginable and just unacceptable. Um, you definitely also touched on this too, but if, in case there's anything else you want to mention here, um, what have been the practices and tools your organization have, has employed in support of residents of Reserve? Um, what resources or partnerships were brought to bear? So I know you mentioned the health study, but any other information would be, would be wonderful. Sure. Um, so, so, so yeah, in addition to, to the health study, we, we, we've been working with the reserve community to advance advocacy on several different fronts. Um, so I can just sort of quickly take you through those, but then kind of harken back to the bigger picture, I think. Um, so Denka is a Japanese company headquartered in Tokyo, and it occurred to us that Denka wasn't feeling any heat at home in Japan, um, that folks in Japan, including environmental justice advocates in Japan, were most likely not even aware of what was happening in Louisiana at the hands of a Japanese facility. We built partnerships with Japanese environmental justice advocates to see how we could generate pressure on Denka in Japan. 
And um, we traveled to Tokyo twice last year in June and, the, and then again in September with two community members, which is critically important um, so that, you know, community members can, uh, can confront DENCA officials themselves, right, and speak for themselves. Um, so along with, with community members, we, we confronted DENCA officials at their headquarters. We protested outside DENCA's annual shareholder meeting. We also met privately with several DENCA shareholders to urge them to use the internal processes at their disposal to demand that DENCA reduce its chloroprene emissions to EPA recommended levels. Um, we held press conferences at the Ministry of Environment and the Foreign Correspondents Press Club so that community members who were with us could directly address Japanese media. Um, their story was picked up by major Japanese media outlets, which really put Denka's back against the wall in Japan. Um, and we also met with the Japan Bank for International Cooperation, which is the, the export credit agency that, that financed Denka's purchase of the Louisiana facility. Um, so they, they clearly you know, did not do their due diligence in terms of approving the loan for the Denka facility. They have policies on environmental and social impact to which they clearly did not adhere. Um, so that's some of the advocacy we did in Japan, which is ongoing in conjunction with our Japanese allies. Um, on the US side, Denka is currently challenging the EPA's assessment of chloroprene as a likely human carcinogen. Um, and so in coalition with Earth Justice and the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, as well as the reserve community, uh, we've met with the EPA to urge them to reject Denka's challenge. Um, two members of the community joined us for that meeting with the EPA in, in Washington, DC. Um, and other tools we've used to support the reserve community include um, ongoing outreach to North American and European shareholders of Denka, uh, production of short videos that use storytelling to highlight community members' individual stories and struggles against environmental injustice. Um, and finally, we've held workshops to provide community members with the tools and talking points to fight industry propaganda and be able to effectively use the results of our health study in their own advocacy. So, the, the big picture here is that it was really important for us to think creatively about advocacy. We thought about advocacy not just locally and nationally, but internationally as well. Because we're dealing with a corporate actor, we've looked at supply chains. Neoprene, which is the synthetic rubber produced by the Denko facility, is used in wetsuits. So we're looking at how we might target wetsuit companies that use neoprene. Um, we targeted Denka's shareholders since they're in a unique position to put pressure on Denka. And finally, we used a variety of tools from a health study to videos that tell stories and enable community members to speak directly to the viewer. Um, each tool is powerful and compelling in its own right. And it's important to draw on a breadth of tools and strategies to advance advocacy. Wow. I mean, I think just the, the level of creativity and the scale of this is just, it's amazing. Uh, just the work that you've, you've done. And I mean, it, it goes to show from being, you know, on the ground in the community like Shoshanda and the, the critical work that she is doing and the importance of having that voice from the community of the people most affected, um, you know, up through the international scale. I mean, this, these issues are, are um, so interconnected. And so, uh, you know, it, it takes so many different approaches um, to really fully tackle them. Um, thank you so much for your perspective on that. Um, lastly, Rohan, can you tell us a little about your organization, University Network for Human Rights, and about the work that you do? Sure. Um, so, so we've been around for just about two years now, um, and we have a dual mission of training the next generation in human rights advocacy and working with communities directly affected by rights abuse to amplify their struggles for justice and advance their advocacy goals and priorities. Um, prior to co-founding the University Network for Human Rights, I was a clinical instructor at Stanford Law School's Human Rights Clinic. Um, and then the director of the clinic and I left to start the university network because we felt that there was a real need to train non-law students in human rights fact-finding documentation and advocacy. Um, until we founded the university network, law school clinics were the only space for structured supervised training in human rights work and only law students were learning the practice of human rights. Um, I, I alluded earlier to the importance of, of this you know, interdisciplinary approach to human rights advocacy. Um, we started the university 
University Network to train undergraduate students of all disciplines in human rights advocacy through a combination of classroom instruction and real world experience working under our close supervision on actual human rights projects. So for example, students have been involved in nearly every step of our work with the reserve community. Um, the, the folks in reserve have met you know, many of our students over the years. Um, currently, we're working with indigenous-led organizations in the greater Chaco region to fight fracking wells in greater Chaco. Um, we're also working on an environmental health disparities project uh, using publicly, health, publicly available um, health and demographic data to look at the relationship between COVID-19 death rates, pollution burden, um, and race and socioeconomic status across the U.S. Um, and we have other ongoing projects in the southwestern part of Louisiana, um, not technically Cancer Alley, but with environmental justice issues that are just as dire, um, as well as projects in India, Bolivia, and the Western Sahara. Thank you for doing that work. Um, <laughs> Lana, um, could you please tell us a little bit about your work with Zero Hour from some of the first efforts Zero Hour coordinated uh, to how your work has shifted during the pandemic? Definitely. So Zero Hour, we uh, started out with organizing the Youth Climate March and that's really what put us on the map. And that was in the summer of 2018. The Youth Climate March included a national march on uh, Washington and DC to demand climate action, as well as over 25 sister marches, which took place on the same day in locations around the world. And uh, the Youth Climate March was accompanied by the Youth Climate Lobby Day in 2018, in which we brought science back demands directly to our leaders on Capitol Hill. And last year, we also organized This Is Zero Hour, the Youth Climate Summit in Miami, Florida, which trained over 350 youth and older allies in climate justice, activism, and organizing. With that in mind, since the pandemic, our work has completely shifted. The 50th anniversary of Earth Day this year, which was supposed to be a massive international mobilization was instead a massive online event. And in general, we've shifted away from our focus on large events to more of a campaign focus. For the first time this summer, Zero Hour did not host a massive event or protest. And instead, we've turned our attention to a national voter registration drive for young people and those who care about young people, encouraging everyone to vote with young people and our futures in mind this November. This campaign is called Vote for Our Future and is being co-hosted with the National Children's Campaign. You can learn more about the campaign by visiting voteforourfuture.org. You can also learn more about the National Children's Campaign by visiting nationalchildrenscampaign.org and learn more about Zero Hour by visiting thisiszerohour.org. In general, this is a direction a lot of the youth movement has taken, moving all of our community and organizer meetings as well as topic panels online and focusing more of our attention on causes such as entrance into force of the Escazú Agreement, support of local Green New Deal candidates, and serving of climate-friendly food at climate change conferences, to name some examples. My main point is, even though the media attention isn't so focused on the youth movement anymore, don't let that fool you. The international youth climate movement is still going and stronger than ever. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lana. Um, so I know climate justice is an important part of Zero Hour's mission. Could you tell us what climate justice means to you uh, and what Zero Hour is doing to promote climate justice? Yeah, to me, climate justice means championing climate action, which actually works for everyone and not the select few. It means upholding human rights, as we've been talking about, the dignity of communities and fighting for the crisis and acknowledging that the impacts of climate change are not equal, but that instead the most oppressed groups in a society around the world often suffer for first and worst from the climate crisis. At Zero Hour, we champion a just transition, which means leaving no one behind in our climate action as we seek to achieve an environmentally sustainable society. It means protecting workers as they transition away from the fossil fuel economy, for example, to a clean, sustainable economy and ensuring that communities of color, indigenous communities, and frontline communities are not left behind in any way. At Zero Hour, what we do is center the needs of communities in all our demands to politicians, from demanding investments in mass transit, which are accessible to people with disabilities in all towns and cities around the world, 
to demanding that new buildings and retrofits be not only sustainable, but also affordable for low income people and families. Within the Zero Hour organization itself, we are led by Latina, POC, and Black women, and we continuously center the voices and demands of frontline youth and communities. We think this is incredibly important, and I think this is also vital to having a successful movement. Absolutely. Um, really heartening to hear. Uh, thank you, Lana. Uh, Shashanda and Ruhan, uh, a question for you. Both and Lana, feel free to jump in as well, of course. Uh, so the American Lung Association and American University recently held a webinar focused on the connections between air quality, COVID, and racial disparities. Um, I encourage audience members to take a look at that webinar on the Unbreathable website. What are both of you seeing on the ground in terms of impacts of COVID-19 in your respective communities? Um, I think like, even like COVID has been labeled this pandemic. Um, and even before COVID, we already had a pandemic and that pandemic was these um, polluting industries that's in the communities um, and harming residents. Um, and so for us, it's these incinerators um, that's here. Um, these incinerators have made people, um, as we know that this uh, COVID attacks the respiratory system. Um, and that's exactly what the incinerator does. It creates uh, asthma, it creates cancer, it creates all of these illnesses that, that has a hard time fighting off COVID. Um, and so to even, um, and I think like just to go off what Lana was talking about, aiming this at um, politicians that's in the city that's like, you are the one that's keeping this system here, that's harming residents, and now you don't know what to do because this pandemic is exposing it. You don't know what to do. Um, and being there to say, like putting pressure on them to say like, you are gonna end ties with these polluting industries. You have to shut them down um, because people will not survive this. People want, there are people that's not surviving COVID because they have had these illnesses before COVID. Um, and so in our work, we are relating those um, to susceptible people and impacted people from pollution. Um, and using that as um, slogans to these politicians to let them know like, this is being exposed, we see you, um, and you see that this is hurting us and you have to do better. Um, and in doing better, we need um, that just transition um, to systems that's respectable to our lives um, and to our environment also, which is getting rid of pollution. Um, it has shifted a lot of like all of those conversations on phones and Zoom, um, where, and still you know, being able to reach residents and impact the people to let them know like this movement is continuing, this won't stop. Um, we still care. We are still dedicated to this mission um, to shut these incinerators down and create um, better solutions for our lives. Um, so that's what we have been saying, um, that this was a pandemic before this pandemic. Yeah, I, so so in the, the, the community in Reserve, Reserve is in St. John the Baptist Parish, which, you know, has off and on had the highest per capita COVID-19 death rate in Louisiana and one of the highest um, in the country, um, no doubt linked to the, the air pollution in the parish. Um, a lot of, uh, some of the, the viewers might have might have seen the, the April, the study by Harvard that came out in April, um, essentially just confirming what public health experts had suspected since the beginning of the outbreak that higher levels of PM 2.5 or fine, fine particulate matter are associated with higher COVID-19 death rates. Um, there was a subsequent study done by researchers at Tulane and the University of Memphis that examined the link between air pollution and COVID-19 in Louisiana specifically. Um, and that study found that all but two of the 10 parishes in Louisiana with the highest per capita COVID-19 death rates are in Cancer Alley um, with St. John at the top. Um, and you know the authors of that study concluded that long-term exposure to air pollution should be considered a pre-existing condition for COVID-19 patients, which which is exactly which is exactly right. Um, the the folks in the community that we've been working with um, 
especially a, a few weeks back, um, where, you know, every, every time I, I spoke with them on the phone, I mean, people could rattle off a list of people they knew who had, who had died of COVID. Um, people were very shaken up and scared. And it, it, is, a, it is an elderly community. So um, people were balancing, you know, the, the need to, to be super careful and vigilant and stay indoors with the desire to continue their advocacy. Um, and you could see folks struggling with that balance. And ultimately, you know, people have continued. I mean, they've been, uh, the community protested, went to their local congressional representative's office um, wearing masks and, you know, not letting this get in the way of their, of their activism. But at the same time, um, you know, quite, quite cautious and scared um, because, because of all of the, um, the, the virus all around them. Um, the, the, the other thing that I'll just quickly mention is that the study by uh, Tulane and, and University of Memphis also found that in Louisiana and in Cancer Alley specifically, higher pollution burdens at the census tract level were associated with larger percentages of African Americans in the population and higher poverty rates. Um, so, you know, much, much has been made of the, the vastly disproportionate death toll of, of COVID on Black people in Louisiana and across the country. Um, and, and it's becoming increasingly clear that exposure to hazardous air pollutants is an important factor um, in that disproportionality. And I think just to add on to that, um, COVID has also just showed how dedicated people are to this um, injustice um, because um, we just did like a stop the truck. So we went down, we did this action at the incinerator that um, stopped the uh, trucks from getting in and out of the incinerator to burn the waste. And people showed up. People came to do a die-in here, um, even in COVID, you know, and it just shows that people are dedicated to it and exactly what you just said around like it affecting people of color. Um, and this is their way of fighting back, even putting themselves on the line further by doing these actions and coming out um, to make sure that this movement keeps moving um, and it does not stop in COVID. And it's really sad to see that COVID has exposed that this air pollution that has been going on for many of years in these communities, over 30 years in several communities. Um, and it didn't need to take this. It should have been exposed a long time ago. Um, Absolutely. Um, and you know, that research is just, I, I think, you know, Ruhan, to your point, it, it, it highlights what folks in public health and feeling the impacts themselves in their community already know. This is real. And at the Lung Association, that's a message that we try to um, emphasize as much as possible. You know, air pollution, it's not just an eyesore. It, it impacts your health. Um, you know, it causes you know, respiratory issues. It shortens lifespans. And, I, and, and in addition to all this, I think COVID is really hammering home that this, this has real health implications. Uh, and it's so important to continue the momentum um, and the fight. And actually a question for Lana here on that, on that note. Um, taking action on climate change and, and you know, clean air, environmental justice, et cetera, but uh, especially climate change being such a global issue uh, can seem overwhelming. And there's so much that needs to happen and some people may feel like, you know, they, they can't personally make a difference themselves. Uh, what would you say to someone who is starting out as a climate activist about small steps they can take to lead to big collective action? Yeah, I would tell them to start somewhere, right? That's what we all did here. And that idea that if you're not having a global impact right away, what you're doing doesn't matter. It's completely incorrect. And, you know, as, uh, as Shoshana has shown, work in your community when you're, or in your school can be especially powerful. And that's a great way to start. If you're a community member or a student, that gives you a special voice to influence what is happening in that community or in that school as a member there. So if your school hasn't divested from the fossil fuel industry, you know, taking their finances out of fossil fuels, if your city hasn't passed a climate emergency or a citywide Green New Deal, if your politicians haven't taken the no fossil fuel money pledge, those are all places that you can start right now. And that's often one of the best ways to start. Also, if there's a particular organization or a movement that you're interested in, don't be scared to reach out. Um, you can reach out to organization or some of their activists, such as those that you see featured on their social media, and just ask them how you can get started and how you can join the organization or movement, because all of these causes need as much help as we can get. We need as many people involved as we can get. 
And as far as small steps that lead to big actions, always look for collaboration and amplification opportunities. That doesn't have to mean a co-branded campaign. It just means that if you want to organize, for example, a climate strike in your town, organizing that strike on an international Fridays for Future Strike Day will be significantly more impactful for collective action and movement power than organizing that strike on the day that you choose a week or a month later. Mostly keep an eye out for what other organizations and movements are currently doing and see how your actions in your community and in your networks can add to what's already happening. And that's how we can together really achieve massive national and international impact. Thank you so much, Lana. Um, I have another question for Shoshanda. Uh, so what are you working on now and what's next for you and for your voice? Um, so what we're working on currently here um, is we have created um, a fair development plan for zero waste that has been adopted um, by city council here in Baltimore City. Um, and so now we're working on that implementation of that plan to make sure that it has equity at the forefront. Um, and that plan was created by impacted voices um, in communities and organizations um, to have buy into this plan. And so now we're just waiting. We're just I'm um, doing trying to get that implemented in a real way. So it's putting pressure on public officials to do the right thing. Um, and like the incoming mayor that we have has pledged to do um, what's in what it's called for um, and implementing a plan like creating the infrastructure and stopping that um, uh, incinerator not renewing its contract. This contract is up in December 2021. So next year. Um, and we plan on not renewing that. Um, you know, and fighting to make sure that it is not renewed um, by putting candidates in office that pledge to doing that. Um, and also, we are um, having, you know, keeping the youth involved um, in their in any capacity. Um, we have a class that's in the school um, where we work with students um, to talk to them about what's going on in their community and give them that voice also. Um, and those students right now, some of them we're still meeting with um, during COVID um, to make sure that they are pushing forward the same thing that we are um, and that their voices are heard in um, this plan and then what we're doing now to push forward. Thank you, Shoshanda. Um, this really, it, it's open for, for everyone on the panel, but um, this is an audience question. Um, so I work in community outreach and engagement at USC Norris Comprehensive Cancer Center, and we are always trying to find ways to educate our community members. What kind of advice would you give to community members who are seeing higher numbers of health disparities in their communities or neighborhoods? Um, and what would be the best practices with providing them with resources? That's a really good question. I think we're all taking a minute to think. <laughs> um, So I think I, I would say that the first the the the, the first step um, and 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 maybe the best advice to give in a situation like that um, is for folks to is for the community to to organize themselves um, and you know get together get together in the same place and kind of map out map out a plan a plan of action together and and I think um, it's 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 really important that that happen before local organizations, outside advocates get involved. Um, it's, 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 it's very important in my experience for communities to already be organized and have their goals and priorities set out and, and already be, be sort of self-directing um, before any help from the outside comes in. Just because if it happens the other way around, it can be um, extremely problematic at different levels. Um, and then you have sort of an inversion of the of the um you know the the type of relationship that you want to see with kind of directives coming from outside when and and the, a lack of agency of the folks who are directly affected so i guess my first piece of advice would be um to to if folks are if folks in a community are noticing health health disparities seemingly abnormal seemingly abnormal levels of illnesses um to, to get together and, and organize um, and, and sort of come up with a plan of action together. 
Um, to add on to that, I would say put a name to whatever that is that you think is creating these health impacts. Um, and exactly like what Rohan has said around like making that plan, organized together, doing outreach within your community, being a part of that community, because it always makes it um, deeper to, for, for community members to hear from someone that they've seen or from someone that lives next door to them than an outsider coming in and try to control what's happening. Um, it makes it more real uh, um, and more experiences that connect because they have that common um, ground that they share um, in communities. And also it just has to start at that grassroots. It has to start with that connection because things will happen that you will not be able to explain and you have to keep fighting against it. You will have people that's in office that's going to go against you in the community that you have to either keep fighting against to sway them to go to the side or get them out of office. And that's going to take a lot of community power. And so you have to have residents always, always starts with residents um, and your community members to um, put a name to that and those common health impacts that's happening. And then doing exactly what um, I'm pretty sure everyone did research, doing research, see what's related, um, what's happening in all across the world, and think about what's happening in your community so you can find a way to talk about it, that you are seeing the same exact thing. Um, so, because people hear that message over and over, and then they're gonna be like, oh my God, I have to do something about this now. There's thousands of people keep bringing this up, um, rather than being divided and going in singly. Thank you so much. Um, building on that, um, another audience question, how can older adults and white folks in general be supportive allies to the frontline communities who are leading the action for change? And um, Shoshanda and, and Lana, I'd love to hear from you and Ruhan, please jump into. I think that this is a question that seems to come around a lot. Um, and I think that always for me, I, I think that everyone sees this movement and anyone can be a part of that movement. I think the way to respect the movement is not to come in with the approach that like, I'm just gonna back off and leave it to them. It's to come in with like an approach that's like, you're part of the team, you're working just as hard, you're not just someone that's gonna come to an event to support us, but you're actively engaged with what's happening in that community. Um, and not like a one-off thing that's like, oh, I did this and now it's done. But it's really doing that behind the scene work that is take on the ground. It's doing that outreach, it's coming in. Um, with the mindset, you know, like to want to do the thinking and strategizing with us. Um, of course, it's not having like a dominating voice that's like stopping everyone, but it's having a voice um, and not just being a, a volunteer that just comes to say, I came. Um, I think the respect of work, you should really step up um, and do what everyone else is doing. See yourself as part of a team um, because these moments, these movements are right on a lot of races in different backgrounds. And we have to come together to to um, defeat what's happening in communities. Um, we have to be saying the same thing across communities in Brook and South Baltimore and Roland Park. All of these communities have to come together to fight back against this injustice because we are all breathing the same air, air travel. So this is your fight too. Definitely agree with Shoshanda. Um, on a larger scale too, just the youth climate strikes first started out being just for young people and then change to being youth led and youth organized, but inviting adults to join us. Because we realized that without middle age, without older adults, we wouldn't be successful, especially as young people that don't hold any positions of power. And I think that coming in and not just saying, oh, I like, I just joined just to say I was here, but asking like, how can I use like what I know, my background, my privileges, the, my positions, my network, all of that I think is very, very helpful, um, especially because you have different positions than we might have. You might have access to different resources than we do and offering that to the movement, I think is a great way to be an ally. I'll just really quickly, I think Shoshanda and Lana just did, did a terrific job um, with that question, but, um, and I, I, I would echo everything they said and, and just, you know, emphasize that, you know, there's a role for everyone to play. And I think one thing that I've seen um, is sometimes there can be a sort of paralysis uh, on the on the left in, in term with, with white folks who, who don't want to, who want to tread very carefully, um, and which is great. It's a great instinct to tread carefully and, and, and ensure that movements are, are led by directly affected people. 
at the same time, that shouldn't lead to a paralysis and, and lack of action and lack of engagement. Um, it's really important for everyone to engage and just be mindful of what that engagement is looking like. Thank you so much. Well, I know we are um, we have five minutes left, so I'll just say, uh, you know, I think it's a it's a really tough time, um, and I would love to you know close here with um, in the spirit of of sharing what keeps you motivated when things are so dire. Um, if you could each share um, what message um, you hope that everyone watching today is, is going to leave this panel with. I would encourage everyone to get involved, no matter what background you're from, no matter what age you have um, where you live in the world uh, or in the country, uh, we need everyone involved and there's honestly no reason, there's no type of person that, sh you know, can't be involved and uh, the earlier you start, the better, right? Don't wait until <laughs> um, you feel like you need to get involved or you feel like someone needs to step up. Uh, like Diana just said, it's very urgent. We, the situation is very drastic right now. There is no better moment than today. The only better day would have been yesterday. So uh, we invite all of you to join us and we, we welcome you into this movement and into this work. I would just say, I, I would just reiterate, you know, some of what we've, we've talked about, which is, um, you know, to, to as you engage in environment, the, the struggle for environmental justice, um, always being mindful of how it intersects with other forms of oppression, because that can oftentimes really materially inform the way you engage, the way you design advocacy strategies, the way you design messaging. Um, and all of that is really, really important because ultimately these these struggles for social justice don't exist in silos. Um, and it's it's really, really important to, to be thinking about, um, you know, how uh, environmental justice is inter interwoven with uh, racial justice, uh, economic justice, um, and, you know, even international struggles for justice and U.S. foreign policy, militarism, et cetera. The, these are all very, very closely related and oftentimes digging deeper um, exposes things that you might not have seen before that inform the way that you engage with environmental justice issues. Um, I agree with everything that was already said. And I think um, to add on to and not repeat what everyone else already said, I would say stay encouraged. Um, this won't happen overnight. Um, like I said, we had incinerators across this world, some of them for over 30 years. And it's not going to take one night to take them away. It's just not. It's going to take a lot of hard work. Um, and sometimes you will get disencouraged. Um, and sometimes things are going to happen that, that's like, for example, here in Baltimore, like we did all this organizing against incinerators. And our current mayor right now is thinking of a settlement deal with the incinerator. And so after all the organizing that has taken place here in these communities, that's what's being considered. And we can all get down and we can all say, God, we're never going to beat this. We're never, this is going to stay in our communities forever. But we didn't. What we're doing now is calling on residents to tell um, Mayor Jack Young that he can't do this, that you can't undo all of the hard work that we have all done. You cannot be the sole player in knocking down all of the conversations for just uh, transition here in Baltimore City. You cannot do that. Um, so we have to stay encouraged. We have to keep calling on each other um, because sometimes it, you get down. Sometimes it gets sad. And you have to have that network of people that can help you be um, lift your spirits back up. Um, that tell you why you remind you why you're doing this in the first place. Um, but this is important that people stand with you. Um, and you're you're on the right side of this. You're on the right side of this. Um, and that whoever is in place that think they empower, you will always have more power when you have power within residents and communities. Um, you always have the power of stories. So tell your stories, um, get involved in any capacity um, that you can. Thank you so much, Shashanda and Lana and Ruhan, uh, just for all of the incredible work you're doing um, within your communities, within the country, on the international scale, uh, just really incredible work uh, and, and thank you for your time today. Um, I guess I'll, I'll close and, and quickly say, 
uh, that we encourage all of you watching to visit the resources uh, listed um, on the slide that about, is about to be shown, including unbreathable.org to learn more about the film and related resources, and lung.org slash air to learn more about the Lung Association's Stand Up for Air for Clean Air initiative, including the activist toolkit being launched tomorrow. Um, have a great rest of your day, and thank you for your interest in today's event. And just to echo what Shashanda said, I think this, the community is so important here, and um, we're, we're all in it together. So thank you for, for joining today, and um, appreciate your time. <laughs>